Joining me today for the interview is Dr. Mohammed Khalifa. Uh, Dr. Khalifa is Professor of Educational Administration and Executive Director of Urban Education Initiatives at The Ohio State University. His research examines how urban school leaders enact culturally responsive leadership and anti-oppressive school practices. He is the author of the highly acclaimed book, Culturally Responsive School Leadership, and that is exactly why Dr. Khalifa is here today. Um, I was introduced to Dr. Khalifa's work through my colleague, Nicole, and uh, really, really looking forward to the opportunity to, to speak with Dr. Khalifa today. So Dr. Khalifa, welcome to the Tom Schubert Podcast. Thank you so much. It's a delight, a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the space. Yeah, really, really happy to have you here. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Nicole, uh, my friend and colleague, introduced me to your work when we were at the AERA conference in Toronto uh, in 2019. And uh, she said, you know, you have to read this book. And I bought the book and I immersed myself in it immediately. And honestly, I, I can't recommend it enough. So listeners, uh, Culturally Responsive Leadership by Dr. Muhammad Khalifa uh, is the book. So I'm excited to, uh, to dig into the content of that book today. But I want to begin, uh, before we dig into that, I want to begin with the Derek Chauvin trial uh, in, in Minneapolis. As I know, uh, you now are at Ohio State University, but of course, you, you spent years at the University of Minnesota and spent a, lo a lot of time in the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, area in the Twin Cities. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, um, as you think about the trial that's still ongoing, um, do you have a sense of first how are you how are you feeling in terms of the you know the the trial itself, and and do you have a sense of the collective kind of atmosphere or mood in the Twin Cities right now as the trial unfolds? Yeah. So so first of all, we're fresh to Ohio. We we've been here for about six months, so we were there. Yeah. Um, when George Floyd happened. Uh, it's funny, I remember where I was at each moment that these sort of high, highly publicized uh, police killings of black men, I remember the exact place that I was. So we lived in an area where Philando Castile was less than a mile from my home. We lived right there. Um, and we would drive by <clears throat> the uh, makeshift uh, space in which it was killed where people put flowers out. And every time we go by there, it's a re-traumatization of what happened is a reminder. So when people talk about black folks in these health conditions and that they're disproportionately high in cancer and diabetes and heart disease, I can understand why, because, uh, you know, I remember exactly where I was when Rodney King happened. And I remember exactly where I was. And I remember the principal coming to, I was sort of like a, a leader in, in my high school. Um, <clears throat> and the principal came to me and said, you know, uh, the officers were acquitted, but we think that it could, because riots were happening around the country at that time, and we think some things should happen at the high school. Since you're kind of a leader, can you make sure that Black people are not angry and don't um, riot or do anything um, destructive? And I said, I, I'm, I'm a part of that group that's angry. I mean, like, wh wh why are you asking us to quell our anger? I mean, so... We thought at that moment that this is absolute, all the proof you need. You see uh, four, five, six officers just trying to kill a black man on the pavement. We knew that this has been happening for a while. It's been happening to all of us, but now we have it on film. There's no way that these officers, the guy was defenseless. He was on the ground. There's no way. He posed no threat and they were acquitted. So I've barely been following the trial. Um, I, I hear sound bites and I hear that this person sobbed on the stand or I hear that the, but I, I, I cannot allow myself to constantly be exposed to, of course, I'm waiting for the verdict. Uh, I don't have, I, I would not at all be shocked, at all be shocked if he was acquitted, not at all. And be, so, so in order to protect my own humanity, in order to protect my own sensibilities, my feelings and everything like that, I, I I'm predicting that uh, he will be acquitted, most likely. And I'm also predicting that uh, it won't come as a shock or a surprise because, you know, we have to protect ourselves from being hurt with this. Um, and I, I don't know if other Black men are experiencing the same kind of trauma and same disposition that I have. I can't, you know, I can't say it's, it's, it's why, but um, I'm not going to follow the trial day by day and, and see the lies that the state, the state always tries to protect itself. Everybody knows that. And um, right. see the lies that they put out and 
you know, ruin the, uh, try, try to demonize and try to completely criminalize the brother's character, all of that. Uh, I come from, a, 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 a lot of people don't know this about me, I come from a, a spiritual faith tradition. And one of the tenets that we hold dear is to constantly give um, to people who are in need, right? Uh, and there's some special groups like the poor, the needy, the orphan, elderly people. And sometimes, so some of those groups, they, ha they have, um, they have some, some issues. Like I have, I have issues with addiction in my family. I have issues with uh, criminality in my family. Uh, I have recidivism as an issue that pops up in my family. And what, what we do in my faith tradition is that we never, ever, ever look at a person's errors, their shortcomings in order to determine whether or not we give. If they need it, we give. If they need food, we get them food. That's it. You don't stand in judgment of people when you're trying to help them. And that's exactly what this trial is trying to do. You know, this person was murdered. He was assassinated. And instead of focusing on that, now it's about his habits, his character. And so I, I can't deal with that kind of traumatization. Yeah. So I'm trying to yeah. stay a little bit distant from the trial. Yeah, and that's fair. And I, you know, uh, what you've just expressed is a common uh, thread and theme that I've heard from, from you know, um, pundits and, and other Black men on TV just saying almost identical things to what you're saying, which is we've been here before. And we would have thought that video evidence would have been the game changer. I, I know for myself back, you know, with Rodney King, I thought, well, okay, this, this is irrefutable. This, this is, it's on video. And even, you know, that, that 30 years now of, of it being on video really hasn't made a difference. So I understand uh, completely, I, at least I can, I, I can't understand, but I'm empathetic to, to the level of cynicism about the system and, and whether or not the system really truly is here to protect all citizens. Or now we've got a situation, as you mentioned, George Floyd seems to be on trial right now half the time. Yeah. It seems to be a question of his character and all of that. So, um, but, I, but, I, but there's a, Tom, there's a value. I know you have another question to get to, but there's yeah, a valuable yeah. lesson for educators here, which yeah. is that culture will eat policy and process for lunch every day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something that educators don't quite get. I write about this extensively in my research okay. that from the yeah. vantage point of being a technical rational leader, which is that when you're uncomfortable with the context, when race comes up, when racism or any of these things come up, uh, you know, you automatically as a school leader run to the policy book instead of looking at the broader context. Right. And this just suggests how powerful the notion of uh, discourse, descriptions of people how people are categorized, how strong, even though these, some of these ideas were birthed four or 500 years ago, even before, I, I, I talk about this in the, in the Institute a lot, but even before America as a country, as a Republic was established, some of the ideas about black people, some of the ideas about people from the global South were established at that time in the minds of European uh, Ameri uh, Europeans and then European Americans, white people about the other. And you could have as many, it, it rings true. You could have as many witnesses, you could have video evidence, you could have the police, you could have the entire system lining up to have a person convicted. But the ideas that black life is not worth much and that white uh, safety needs to be protected, white uh, security needs to be protected at the expense of all else, including black life, including indigenous life, those ideas are still very powerful and at the very epistemological surface of uh, educators, of police, of the society at large. So I, I can, I'll, I'll stop there because I know we yeah. got to get to the interview. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> no, you, you, uh, you know, I mean, you, you take it, take things where you, where you need to go. I think your the point is well taken. And um, I, I just, you know, I, I look at the trial and I think to myself, I, I, I can't even imagine the aftermath if this man is acquitted. Um, with with all that we know about what took place, even witnesses in his own police department uh, talking about the unnecessary force, et cetera. Um, we, we're losing the plot if we continue to put George Floyd on trial and his character uh, and and not think about what what has happened in that. I want to I want to keep with this theme for a moment before we get to the book. And I want to set the next question up and I'm going to do this with a little bit of finesse and it's going to take me a bit a bit of time to set this up. So bear with me listeners bear with me here for a moment. Um, so I, one of the things that um, I sort of use the professional sports or the collegiate sports analogy, one of the things that 
professional sports do, uh, professional collegiate teams do, is they they go through a, a process of self scouting, uh, where they kind of scout themselves. Especially if a team is doing really well, they want to know the purpose of that exercise is to reveal any kind of blind spots or tendencies that can get overlooked as a season unfolds, right? So a team might uncover that, look, you know, we have a very obvious tendency on third and long that we always pass or we never, you know, we always run or something unfolds so that they can make sure that they're not predictable or they're not, you know, getting those blind spots. So I want to take that concept of self-scout uh, to the work in society around racial equity and cultural responsiveness. Um, look, we know that there aren't enough podcasts out there to talk about all the things that white people need to do to dismantle systemic racism. And I'm saying that because I wanna be clear that what I'm about to ask you is not kind of veiled as a blame the victim uh, insinuation. So that's not where I'm going with this. But my question is this, you know, when you, when you look at what's happened since May 25th of last year, um, and we know, of course, that the work in racial equity, and we just talked about Rodney King, we know this is not new. Uh, uh, this is a, an age old uh, challenge that society has faced, and, and particularly black people have faced. But certainly since last May, there was a, a, a flip in intensity around and and around the racial equity work and the anti-racist work. So there was a, to me, there was a seismic shift in the, in the collective consciousness about the importance of dismantling system, systemic racism. So here's where I'm going with this. When you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, or you look at individuals who are, are championing like yourselves and, and uh, Ibram Kendi, et cetera, who are, who are talking about the anti-racist work, if you were to self-scout the last year and think about the anti-racist work that has been happening since May of last year. Um, would Do you see any areas where there could have been maybe a different approach, a different strategy that something might be preventing more progress and more permanent changes in our society at a more rapid pace? Thoughts on that? I know that was a long question, but I just yeah. looking reflectively, where, where might we find some blind spots and, and what can we do to sort of resolve those? No, no, it's, it's a very important question. And, I, and thank you for taking the time and care um, needed to ask the question because uh, it could be read as, as uh, one inviting critique of people who are on the front lines, who have devoted their lives to this work and who are learning to do this real time. They don't have time to stop and plan because they're in the middle of it. Middle of it. It's like you being on an airplane that's going down and you're trying to you know, you don't have time to go and read a couple of books and, you know, so um, I, 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 there, there are any number of ways to, to approach this question. One could approach it as a private uh, activist, um, you know, who's, who's uh, been involved in the work. And, and I have, you know, I'm not a leader in that work, but I've definitely tried to show up anytime that um, broader communities are invited to that. Uh, one could uh, try to answer the question as a, some sort of social critic. Let me let me try to approach it as a scholar, okay. um, and I and I and I would like to uh, call upon the black radical tradition of many of the uh, black and and then also um, you know indigenous uh, freedom fighters who have been anti colonial for 100, 150 years. And one of the things that uh, as I see it, um, that they did, um, that I would like to encourage my brothers and sisters in the, in the movement and the Black Lives Matter and anti-racist movement is to, <clears throat> is to begin to imagine beyond critique. And so, of course, do we have to resist uh, police brutality? Of course, many of our leaders have been, have been talking about this. I mean, Malcolm X has maybe three or four speeches in which he talked specifically, like the title of the speech was police brutality. And this is like <laughs> 1963, 1962. Uh, Martin Luther King has talked about. So, so we've been talking about police brutality for 50 and 60 years. We've been critiquing housing discrimination for 75, 100 years. We've been critiquing uh, discrimination and racial oppression in schools. So we know how to critique. We have places from which we can critique, but what we don't have well figured out and what I would love to encourage from a place of love that my, for my brothers and sisters to encourage is what next? What do we do with the critique? What do we do as we critique? How are we building? Because if we're not, 
then the corollary and the suggestion is that all we want is a bigger piece of this pie. And, I, and, and some of us might want that. And some of us do not want that. And for me, for one, I want radical revolutionary change to much of what we see. Schools, uh, justice systems, political structures, all of that. And so if, if, if we're only critiquing, then we're saying we're okay with everything. We just want less pain. We want more access to resources, but everything else about this colonial project is fine. And, 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 and I'm just, uh, I, I don't think that uh, <clears throat> some of the anti-racist people have thought that, thought about that. And that's necessary. You, you have to be kind of planning that as you deconstruct and you critique these various systems. I mean, I've, I do it in my work. Many of, many of the anti-racist scholars do it in their work. Um, activists are doing that. But I, 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 I rarely hear though, what is it that they are trying to build? Like what does community self-determination look like for the communities that you're advocating for? Um, this question is particularly insidious and I, I'm being specific about the Twin Cities now. Yeah. Because there's a certain level of currency that comes with people being critical and critiquing up in the Twin Cities, um, regardless of if, if change happens or not, regardless of if there is another vision of, rea of, uh, of existence, of beauty, of humanity, all of those things that go to the very humanness of Black and Indigenous people. Uh, they have no notion of that, but as long as they step up, it could be a CEO who ignored it for 20 years. It could be a, a school superintendent who has never hardly speak, spoken at all. And they stand up and say, we need to do some racial equity work. And it's like, wow, superintendent of the year. Okay. This is the, he is the embodiment of what a CEO, a corporate suite, a C-suite leader should be. And it's like, hold on a second. The person has just said what we've been saying for 75 or hundred years. Right. Where's the, what is it? What is it? What does the plan look like? And so up in the Twin Cities, more than other places that I've lived in the country, and there's some other places like this too that I could say, but twin, the Twin Cities has this particularly bad. And so what that does is it develops a culture of hypocrisy, of people claiming that they, and I, I'm not laying this on the Black Lives Matter, by the way, but I'm just yeah. saying that this is the context of the Twin Cities. And when you look at Black Lives Matter and that, regard, then you, you'll have a lot more people even identifying and putting the sign in the yard. And then when me, as a black man walks by, it's like calling the police. What, what, wait, hold on a second now. What, what kind of hypocrisy are we dealing with here? Right. And so, um, so, so I would just encourage uh, folks who are doing the anti-racist work to also do what scholars call decolonial work or um, ancestral work, uh, community-based work which means that they are building some in place of what has been so oppressive. Right. And I'll stop. Right. The, re, the reimagining of, of what it would look like. I think that, you know, it's something I, I've not thought of and I appreciate the response because I mean, it was kind of, I, I wasn't anticipating your answer, but it was kind of what I was asking was essentially, you know, what is, what is the, uh, what's the plan going forward? And I love that idea of reimagining a, a, a truly a new reality. Um, so let's pivot now to specifically the book, Culturally Responsive Leadership, and let's talk for the remainder of our time about schools and, and the work that needs to happen at the school level, because, you know, again, some of the societal issues are beyond the realm of, of educators. They, they can certainly participate, but uh, in, in these societal issues around police brutality, that, that is a, a community conversation. That's a statewide conversation. That's a city conversation. But as far as schools are concerned... So, so along that thread, with the idea of the societal practices and policies, so you have, as we, as we mentioned, police brutality, you talk about uh, urban disinvestment, uh, you talk a, a lot about, you know, highway expansion and how, it, how highway expansion often pushes into to Black neighborhoods and Black communities. So as an educational leader, you're a principal of a school or a district superintendent, those are issues that go far beyond your sphere of influence. So how do school leaders challenge the status quo and how do they push back against oppression? You, you know, I, I don't know that I agree that that, that is beyond the sphere of influence. I, I would agree okay. that it is out of their pay scale responsibility. I, I would agree with that. Fair, fair. But I've tried to be uh, very intentional about naming and raising up the legacy of principles in the modern era, as well as 
There are other people who do this in historic moments, uh, such as Vanessa Siddle Walker, Jerome Morris, and others mm -hmm. who, uh, who show how earlier Black leaders um, have served as community leaders as well. But in my, in my research, I try to uh, highlight uh, current leaders uh, who make it very, very, very much a part of their work to go out into communities that they serve and be influential there. Not to appropriate the work. In other words, you show up, that's not your issue, but you now care about that, which is good. That's, that's what we're asking you to do. But now you're the leader of that work. That's not what leaders need to do. Right. They need to, though, learn what is impacting their communities. I worked with um, one particular uh, district, Bloomington, uh, Minnesota, quite a bit. Uh, and Dina Wade Ardley and, and her team, just fabulous uh, educators who have put their lives in harm's way. Uh, her and her team, uh, as well as other leaders across that district um, to, to say emphatically that no, uh, yes, we, we, we are leaders in the building. So there, there, are, there are people in the modern era who are doing this. I, I write about Joe in much of my work, right. where if ICE is going to descend upon your district or police are gonna come brutalize parents or children in your district, or if there's a lack of jobs, or if there are other kind of issues that you show up as advocates, not allies. I'm, 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 I'm a scholar. I know what word I'm using, and I'm not using, intentionally, I'm not using the word ally, okay? okay. I'm using the word advocate, because now you have something, you have, you have a man in the fight. Right. Now you, have, I don't want to say dog in the fight. People are sensitive about dog fight. But you see what I'm trying to say. Now you have skin in the game. How, how yeah. about that? I, I don't yeah. know the history of that term either. <laughs> yeah. But now you, you, you're invested. Right. Let's use right. that term. You're not lips. You're not hypocritical anymore. Now, right. because, because as you, you know this. I mean, Tom, yeah. leaders can be fired at any time for any reason. And they know right. that. Right. It happens all the time. You, your contract was renewed. You fell out with the superintendent. So... That should be a non, whether or not your job is secure, because one gentleman who I write about extensively in my work, Joe, the district tried to fire him, but because he had the community connection, mm. right? Right. They were not able to. The, the community rose up time and time again. And I've written about cases across this country in which communities have risen up to protect their interest within and around schools. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, your job is to be an instructional leader. Yes, your job is to uh, initiate new policies. Yes, your job is to lead uh, instruction, pedagogy, is to engage with community. Yes, I get all of that. But you, I would argue, based on research, that your job is also to try to influence the issues around your school that impact the lives of who? The people you claim that you're serving. Right. There, there's a mind, there's a wall in the mind of educators that is imaginary. It really does not exist. There's nothing that can prevent us from going out there and doing that. So yeah. I don't mean to skirt your question, but I do no, want that's... to just emphasize, as I do in my research, that your work is beyond the school walls. Yeah. Your work is beyond educational issues. Yeah. If your community is experiencing you're in a rural Minnesota community and there's a high uh, rate of heroin or methamphetamine overdosing, you need to make that your issue. Yeah. Yes, it's not in the curriculum or in the policy, but that is what your people, these are humans. They have mm -hmm. humanness about them. And how can you show up and say, look, I don't care about all of the other humanity that this person is experiencing, jobs, whatever, healthcare. All I care about is it even though these things are preventing the education you claim you care about, and they're pre preventing you from having credibility, rapport, relationships with them, which is crucial to education. All these other issues that you're ignoring as an educator are preventing the things you claim you care about. It's yeah. really ironic to see educators or leaders show up and claim that they're not gonna deal with any of the other stuff in the community or advocate for that or put their careers on the line for that. And most of that is imaginary too, most times, People who have gone out and advocated for stuff, even I've seen some people stand up against ICE in their district, they're not fired. I mean, come yeah. on, let's get real about that. Right, right. That is a fear that they're carrying and it never happens. Yeah. And so they're here claiming that they only care about edu you know, education and, and then they're leaving all other aspects of humanity. And so I think that educators should start there and go into right. communities, not just physically, but even emotionally, epistemologically, psychology, yeah. psychologically yeah. and all of that. Yeah. 
Well, first, Professor, let me let me say I appreciate the correction on the on the question for sure, because, uh, you know, it, what I intended to say was beyond their pay grade, but I really appreciate your response and, and the pushback on the way that I phrased the question, because I think that's a really good point. And I, and I think that leaders can sometimes fall into that trap. And I probably fell into that trap when I crafted the question. So I, I really do appreciate. And the other piece I want to pick up on just in reflection of your response is, I have, ha have not yet heard that distinction between ally and advocate kind of phrased that way. And I really do appreciate the distinction between, you know, uh, so would it be your sort of contention that to be an ally would be to, to do things, but to do it passively, you know, it's post a black square on Instagram. It's, it's, it's retweet a, a quote or a, or something, whereas an advocate is you're invested in the work. Is that, is that the distinction? Am I drawing a correct distinction between the two? You, you are, and that would look like, like you're, you're, we're in a meeting, somebody says something that's wild against, um, you know, let's say you're serving a Somali family and yeah. you stand up for them, Tom, in the meeting. And here I am in the meeting and I hear it. You might see a little gesture from me, but I don't say anything while you're excoriated by, by the leaders in the building. And then on break, we, we're in the bathroom and I say, you know, Tom, you really had a good point. But wait on a second, Muhammad, your question should be, Muhammad, wh why are we in the bathroom? Right. relieving ourselves and now you mentioned that now right mm -hmm. why did you say that in the meeting so right. allyship allows you to play safe it allows you to gauge the level that you will support something if it's politically expedient then you can show up if it might be politically uh more spurious or damaging then you hold back and you are in secret or to the extent that's comfortable for you supportive of that Advocates don't don't do that. Advocates are one hundred percent all of the time, fully in. They're visibly in. Uh, they don't just use their uh, political capital, but economic, physical, whatever they have, yeah. to show that they are one hundred percent behind this issue, as though it was their own issue. Because in many ways, it is. Yeah. You you talk a lot about epistemology, and I think for for some listeners, uh, and for, generally for all of us who who don't take the, as deep a dive as you do, um, what what is epistemology, and why, from your perspective, as you write in the book, is it so critical for those engaged in anti racist and anti anti bias work? Okay. Why is that so important? A absolutely. Well, the reason it's so important is because anti bias work has largely been a failure for schools. I've I, let, let, let me let me let me explain what I mean by that so people don't walk away with the wrong, wrong idea because I don't I don't want anybody to walk away misquoting me saying that they should not do anti-bias work they should do something they should do that as well but right. the question that epistemological scholars and people who dive and dive in epistemology ask is where are those biases from why are you merely addressing biases and not interrogating more deeply like what are causing those biases to show up like that and that's why I, I don't think that anti-bias work is a, is a starting place. Um, I think that once you have a good understanding of what is causing the biases to show up, because I've been in districts, more than one, who have done anti-bias work for years in the numbers around disproportionalities, racial disproportionalities, and other uh, disproportionalities continue to show up past the anti-bias work. Now, epistemology asks... What are the knowledges? What are the experiential frames? What are, how, what is everything that's in your mind that you pull on in order to define and interpret what you're seeing in the world? So like to, to bring it into schools, principals every day, every day at every moment have to make decisions about things around them. And less of it is about policy and more of it is about interpretation of policy. Because I've seen principals say, now, nah, you know, I know it's aunt and we've talked about this. Now, there's a policy in place. Yeah. But I see them every day, all day say, no, nah, well, well, you know, that's not going to work. The parent, we, we talked to the mother. Blah, blah. So now they navigate and negotiate around policies all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a, it's not a policy question that I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about a practice question. And I'm talking about how do you, so like you're standing in the school, Mary walks up, Mary says, look. I can't have Deshaun in my class anymore. Deshaun is disrespectful, All right? Deshaun comes up and says, Mary, she doesn't like me. You go to Deshaun as a principal. On a split second, you have to pull knowledge in order to know who to believe. 
in order to understand what what is disrespectful and what's not disrespectful like all of these decisions have to be made and educators are able to and leaders in particular are able to come to schools and act as though they don't have these repertoires of knowledge right that they use to interpret and believe mary in this incidence more and deshaun in that incidence more and usually they're believing mary and not deshaun which is why we have the achievement gap uh, and, and the discipline gap. Now, epistemology, getting more specific. It's, it comes out of a branch of philosophy, but I won't bore you with that conversation. But <laughs> uh, uh, what it is, is, is conversations that we've heard as a child. I mean, we've got to really dig deep. It's comic strips, books that we've read, just how we were shamed by our grandmothers or our aunts. You know, you don't do that, boy. So, all, so now you're in school saying, we don't do that. But hold on a second. Why, why don't we do that? I do that. You mean you don't do that because your grandmother, who was white from Germany originally, told you not to do that. And that's bad. And that's disrespectful. And that's loud. See, all of these terms that I'm mentioning, bad, disrespectful, loud, he's a genius. All of these terms come from a specific historic moment in history. And I'm sorry, but you're white and you're middle class and I'm black and I'm poor and he's indigenous and he's from the res. And guess what? Everybody's definition of loud, of bad, all of that differs. But how do you add meaning to yours? Well, you pull from your history. That's why we talk about epistemology. And now you can mm -hmm. see the complexity of what I'm saying and why bias work, mm -hmm. which is led by data usually. The data looks like this. Well, what are our biases? Now, hold on a second. That's part of it. The other thing that epistemology does is something that I refer to in the book as critical self-reflection. The first two chapters in the book are really framing everything that will, all of the later chapters in the book. So critical self-reflection allows us to see epistemology, allows us to see bias in a, in a much more broader uh, perspective right. than is talked about now. Tom, mostly in schools, people show up and they just merely want to talk about their own personal racial autobiographies or racial biographies or whatever. And that is important. But in the academy and in the book, we talk about multiple spaces that you need to interrogate. So one of them is personal, but another one is, this, is uh, systemic. Another one is community engaged, right? Another one is behavioral. So you have all of these different spheres where you need to ask the question, differently the question this is the same question but it, it it reshapes in each of these spheres but the same question is how am i reproducing oppressive context for these people that i serve right as right. as a person as a leader how's the data how's the community engaged aspect of that so you're asking the same question but in sort of like in different spaces of the work you do and that's deeply uh, you know connected to epistemology too because one thing that I'm not saying, yes, are there epistemologies that all middle-class white people might share? Yes, there likely is. Are there epistemologies that black working class people might share? Yes. Are there epistemologies that most wealthy people might share? Yes. All of these things are true. So I don't take the position in the book necessarily that epistemology is bad. Everybody just has it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like the way you walk, right? You, you, the way you walk is not worse than mine. The way you walk might run down my carpet more. The way you walk might rub, run down your hip bones or whatever more. But what I, what I do say though, what I do critique and what I am sensitive about is you showing up with power. Now remember all educators and administrators in schools have a, a bit of power to interpret the policy as you see it, to enforce the policy when you want to or to ignore it when you want to, right? All of these things are aspects of power. So what I do critique is for you to show up in schools with that power, and now you're acting like you don't have an epistemology. That's the problem. Yeah. Not, not I mean, of course, all of us have some things about our epistemology that we need to check. No doubt about that. Right. But that's not the point I'm making in the book. In the book, I'm saying, look, now you're showing up with your epistemology and you're not interrogating it. You're only doing bias where you're not interrogating deeply or like where these biases are coming from. Yeah. And you're acting like you're a neutral arbitral and you're just looking at the policy. Well, no, nope, not Deshaun, you did such and such. But no, that's got epistemology written all over it. Yeah. And you're acting like you don't have one and only Deshaun has one. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of um, where I go with that. 
that that is such a, a great segue into the next question because I want to talk about uh, the residual effect of culturally responsive schools, culturally responsive leadership. And I'm imagining that as this work, you know, expands within a school, I'm imagining uh, a more expansive space for my minoritized students, for sure. When you think about, we, we talked earlier about what has typically been defined as good behavior. Um, you know, the idea of the key, you talk about widening the space and having a real and permanent impact on the disproportionate ways in which Black, Brown, Indigenous children, students, teenagers are disciplined, that, that the school discipline approach has really been defined through that white Eurocentric lens, and that what is traditionally good behavior in school is really defined through that narrowness. And I'm, I'm imagining that as this culturally responsive work, you know, widens the space, we'll start to see uh, an impact on that. Your thoughts on that, for sure. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Because it's also uh, something of a bit of invisibilization process that happens. And what I mean by that is to say, that while what you while what you said is true and while what I say is true, obviously it's obvious to me that leaders don't see how they're doing this. It's not mm-hmm. apparent to them. They look at the data. They're frightened by the data. They know it's happening. Their indications. They hear student voice. They hear parent voice complaining. They know it's happening, but they don't see how and they don't know how it's happening. And it happens in a number of ways. Some of it is more explicit, exclusionary. Some of it is implicit. So, like uh, explicit, we know right? We, we see that. We see the referrals. We can go. One of the things we do in the academy is we take things like those referrals and we say, okay, now this is a referral. A parent disagreed with you. A student disagreed with you, but you and your teacher felt this way. Historicize not just the parent, historicize not just the student, but historicize yourselves in the school. Why did you come to this meaning for this artifact or for this referral or whatever? But it, it doesn't only happen through uh, explicit means as well, right? It happens implicitly. Like, you know, I'm not, you, you, you know, like there's a lot of uh, conversation, for example, one example is it happens with gifted and talented courses. So there are serious problems across Minnesota and almost every district that I've visited and I'm familiar with the data in which the gifted and talented or advanced classes, you know, don't have many people of color in there. Black right. and indigenous are very rare, right? Mm-hmm. And then what happens when you find that I've, we've done equity audits. So we know we've talked to these students, what happens when you do have a child from a family, or maybe not from any particular type of family, just a genius, right? A genius child who wasn't discouraged from enrolling, even though they were qualified to do that. They had that one teacher who, white teacher, who saw the promise and benefit and said, you know what, I'm not going to discourage you. I know it's a wide practice in this district to smart Black kids to discourage them from going into gifts and talent. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find the promise in you. And I'm going to make sure you're in there. Then the child shows up there, right? And then they get an A on the test. And the teacher, well, Deshaun, I'm sorry for picking on Deshaun so much in a second. (laughs) I had a close friend, Deshaun. I love him. There you go. Michigan. Deshaun has gotten an A. Look at all of you. So now you're tokenizing. You're exoticizing. You're doing all of these things Mm -hmm. to cause this kind of attention. So now you're exclusionary toward them without even knowing it. You might even think you're being benevolent. Right. Right. And so what, what it takes is a deep dive into all of the indicators that students, not that you, but that students use to measure your climate. Right. Right. How are students making? I don't care. I come. One of the questions I ask when I'm, when I'm talking to groups of administrators and teachers is, how is your school climate? How comfortable are students? And I, 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 I'm listening to what they say, but I'm also listening critically what they say. Mm-hmm. And uh, if, they're, if they're not ever saying, well, we use a systematic approach in order to ask the people, because most of them say, well, I have a good relation. It's always I and my interpretations and my epistemological orientations around how I understand whether a school is comfortable or not. But I, I don't, I mean, you have power. You're, you're fine. You're, you're, you're okay. I'm more worried about students and by extension, the communities uh, that are coming. How do they interpret something? And are they just telling you what you want to hear when you ask them, which uh, many, many professors have found that students do. They, they, you ask them, do you like it here? They say, yeah, I love it here. I love it here. Right. Because they know that's what you want to hear. Some students do that. Some will be brutally honest with you. Thank God. 
So, uh, so, so th- th- there are many, many aspects to this question. We can go deeper with it if you'd like. Yeah. But that, yeah. yeah. What, um, what, let, let's stick with this theme for a moment here. Uh, you know, let's say, let's imagine I'm a principal. Mary brings me Deshaun and Mary says, you know, Deshaun was disruptive. Uh, and, and Deshaun says she doesn't like me. What can I do in that moment? So I'm, I'm in that situation. I don't have hours to reflect. I kind of have to deal with this in, in a relatively short period of time. What are maybe some, some questions I could ask myself as, as, as the principal sitting in that room, thinking to myself, okay, you know, how, how would I recognize that, that some of that is affecting my decision-making without even realizing that, that my, my background, my bias, all, all of that is affecting that. What are some of the things that I could do to explore that? Well, w- one thing that you could do is, is not give uh, answer on the spot. Another thing that you could do is, is I mean, most, most leaders I know do have uh, teachers in the school that they know get it, who are committed to the work. So people like that are natural mentors for people like Mary, who mm-hmm. uh, obviously might be trying to figure something out. Um, and then uh, it, it, it is, it, I hate to say this, because I know you, you indicated in the question, you don't have a lot of time for reflecting and reading and stuff like that. But in order to unlearn, one has to learn. There's yeah. no other way around that. I, I'm not seeing it happen. Every other thing that I could recommend to you is, would just be a quick fix. I mean, you have superintendents across Minnesota that have tried quick fixes without doing the deep learning right. that's, that's necessary in order to unlearn practice. Mm-hmm. One scholar and good friend of mine said, it took me 20 years to unlearn what it only took me 10 years to learn. Right. So unlearning takes time. Epistemological engagement takes time. And so I know we don't have a lot of time, so it has to be planned and charted out because the, the, the reality is, is that if Mary had the proper training and the proper guidance and the proper mentoring, she would have never showed up at your office with that. That's where, that's where you wanna get to when you, see, when you begin to see real cultural change. Because I could easily tell you to say, all right, let's, let's have a mediation se- session, let's go to PBIS, let's, let's have a, a, a three-person mentoring session. But like, you know, you might have 35 or 40 principals in the building. You, don't, you cannot do, like you don't have that kind of time. That would, that would consume all of your time as a leader. So the, the, the real, and, and this is what I hope leaders take away from this, that look, it would be more taxing on me to continue to do things the way I'm doing anyway, even from a cost benefit analysis perspective. If I continue to do things like this, it w- it's going to be more costly to me anyway. I may as well invest the time and do a whole staff journey training with the right people, with the right readings. And then at that point, Mary does not show up like that. Deshaun may show up like that because he probably has good reason to believe that Mary doesn't like him. But D- Deshaun doesn't work for you. <laughs> right, Deshaun no. is being served by you. So that's, that's right. a big difference with that. So. Yeah, it's a, that's a massive difference for sure. And I think the, the, <laughs> the uh, you know, sometimes like you're the only adult in the room, like let's think this through here. Uh, and, and I think your point is, is really well taken in that, you know, there's that adage that always suggests that being proactive is more efficient and effective than being reactive. And I think the first step is that level of awareness and then beginning to engage in the work so that you're not put in that position where you have to make an acute decision, um, you know, within a matter of, you know, an hour or two, because Mary has brought this uh, sort of intense kind of uh, situation to the forefront. So um, I think we could, we could probably spend a whole podcast just talking about student discipline and culturally responsive. So uh, maybe I will use that as an excuse to have you back. uh, And we'll talk just about that. But I want to finish up with a couple of things. I want to talk about the leader's role in developing uh, culturally responsive so this kind of is a, is a segue with the story about Mary, culturally responsive teachers and culturally responsive curriculum. What's the leader's role in uh, bringing about this? You argue that this is crucial, that a leader's role is to, to both bring about, you know, culturally responsive teachers and curriculum. So how do leaders go about doing that? <clears throat> well, now we get into the nuts and bolts of what people see themselves as, as leaders, as school leaders, right? So it's the yeah. whole curriculum and pedagogy. And so I, I argue that, not surprising. so the way that equity work has happened until now is that folks, leaders show up in schools, superintendents and districts, and they think that they have the one day in which they look at uh, data. Then they have another day where they invite a high profile leader in, uh, or I'm sorry, speaker, leader, whatever, in order to talk about race. 
And they think that perhaps through osmosis, I don't know what they're thinking, but they think that somehow this racial knowledge that they've gained is somehow going to seep into walkthroughs, hiring, budgeting, scheduling, all of these kind of recruitment into gifted and talented, pipeline to college. They think that somehow, somehow that all of this racial stuff that they've learned in the one day, you know, that they've had or whatever is somehow going to infuse itself into leadership work, school leadership work. And guess what? It never does. Right. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so um, what we argue and what we try to, what we do in the academy, we have like maybe seven or eight activities in the academy where we do offer, uh, there's a, there's, there's a, um, a principal up in uh, Roseville, uh, Mary, Dr. Mary Bussman, who uh, worked with us and, 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 and others. But what she worked on specifically is a culturally responsive observation tool, right? And mm -hmm. we say, like, we don't give you this to go into, uh, you know, your schools and say, okay, now we got this tool. No, we're giving you this. We have another protocol we use. We have a curriculum, a culturally responsive curriculum check. We have all of these things that we give you and say, now, you don't have to use this tool but use this tool to critique what you have. Because the problem is, and I'm gonna get more specific in a minute with your question, but I'm still at a general moment yeah. right now. The problem is, is that people kind of uh, have these different tools right now that they use in their district. And whether or not the tool is checking for cultural responsiveness is an optional part of the tool. So for example, you can use the Danielson framework and you can go in and it could be, you know, a black male teacher who's ignoring all of his Somali female students, right? You can mark everything positive with Danielson or Mozano or some of the other tools that you use, despite the fact that he is in, you know, maybe knowingly, maybe unknowingly, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's beside the point to some extent when it comes to the lives of children, but he is somehow marginalizing all of these Muslim Somali female girls in his class. Now, hold on a second. How, how can he be using, he be evaluated on a walkthrough or a, a four hour observation in a classroom and he's in, he, he is uh, explicitly marginalizing towards, so that's something that should never happen. So all of the tools we introduce in the academy and the work that is in the book and the suggestions in the book is that no, it's not that equity happens here and then leadership here and just leave the leader to figure out how to, no, you need to have policies, you need to have tools, you need to have processes that reflect the equity day that you had. So mm -hmm. every single process, how you monitor, how you look at curriculum, how you select curriculum, how you select text, what the curriculum should be, all of that has to have, you know, if so, some people do professional learning community work. So that means that the PLC work, you have to have of the four broad questions, we do this in academy too, you have to have sub questions that respond to and reflect cultural responsiveness at every single level of leadership and at every tool and in every policy. And so that's kind of, um, so, so, I mean, so the, there, there are many activities that we do in order to ensure that, but uh, uh, we do have, you know, curriculum, culturally responsive curriculum checks that we do in the academy. Yeah. We yeah. have culturally responsive evaluation tools. We have culturally res responsive PLC activities. And all of these things, we, we don't do the entire activity in the academy, but we do an hour uh, or longer as much as we can because we got a lot of stuff to cover uh, so, that pe so that leaders begin to get a practice of how to do this work in their buildings and then in their schools to, in order to make the pedagogy curriculum, the classroom climate, we have a couple of activities on that to make them all more culturally responsive. Yeah, so that's a great way to... Uh to segue again into uh, sort of the final, not question, but opportunity for you, because I did want to give you the opportunity to kind of promote the, the Culturally Responsive Leadership Institute. T you've told us a little bit about the content and the curriculum that, that you kind of follow in the Institute. What are some of the logistical things? Like, you know, when is it hosted? Can, can you yeah. share with listeners if they're interested in the Institute, um, just what are some of the logistics around it and, and kind of how does it work when you, once you register? Sure. It, well, it is in high demand now. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's really taken off. We're doing it in multiple states. Uh, we're coming. We're coming to Minnesota uh, maybe two or three times this year. Um, remaining, you know, uh, yeah. we we were doing uh, virtual, but now we're kind of transitioning back face to face now that people are more comfortable with that. We we've done it in rural areas. We've done it in northern and southern Minnesota. 
We've yeah. done urban, we've done uh, suburban. Um, and what it is, is 2.5 days of deep learning. So folks are going to be asked to read the book in its entirety, um, which is a good thing. I mean, learning is yeah. a good thing. Every single profession out there, learning is a regular part of it. And I think it should be a part of this too. Um, and then there are 10 or so other articles. My, um, my, uh, my partner and colleague and close friend, Dr. Katie Pakel, uh, co-leads with me. Katie is a principal in residence at the University of Minnesota. And I'm, I'm still affiliated with the University of Minnesota myself. I'm uh, uh, through Cary Institute. And um, okay. yep, so uh, I'm a senior equity fellow there. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. still in town quite a bit. But Dr. Katie Pakel uh, and I, Dr. Katie Pakel and I go back and forth quite a bit because I would like the article list to be more like 20 to 25. And she's like, Muhammad, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Your limit is 10 articles. But anyway, we have a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, 2.5 days of deep learning. Um, we'd prefer to have it together, but we have broken it up uh, in the past, mm -hmm. like one day, day one, day two, and then 2.5 at another, uh, day 0.5 at another right. uh, moment. But we prefer, we think it's more powerful if, if it's all together. Uh, and in addition to the reading, though, uh, not, not to scare folks, the things that are more exciting is that we asked them to be, bring loads of artifacts, uh, data sets, um, and other things that can help them deeply the policies. You know, we do yeah. critiques and policy analysis mm -hmm. uh, tools, uh, discourse analysis tools and stuff like that, so that we can really have this deep learning. And, and, and we've had some superintendents come back three, four times for it, um, associate superintendents, yeah. uh, principles because it's such a rich learning opportunity. Um, we have their, orga their organizations or districts up in um, Minnesota in which we, um, they, 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 whenever they have new leaders that they hire, they send them to us. Um, you know, we work with Project Success. So that's a nonprofit that serves Minneapolis public schools. They're doing great work uh, with Sister Adrian up there. And so uh, there are a lot of uh, folks who really believe in the work and we're happy about that because we do too. And we, we think that equity work cannot remain in the realm of uh, being sort of interpersonal. That is a, an important aspect of it, but it, until systemic change. So the focus of this is systemic change. And it's so beautiful when you get these leaders from different spaces, all bringing what they do well and bringing their vulnerabilities and what the, where they need to learn more. And sharing that, that even the cross like pollination of knowledge that happens is, right. is, is, very, is a very powerful aspect of it. But uh, with all of the data, the tools, the policies, the artifacts that they bring, and then the reading, it gives, and then the activities that we've planned, that we've carefully planned and selected, it, it really gives a, a chance for leaders. Because usually leaders don't get this opportunity in most districts. Right. You, right. They, we, yeah. they told us, we, this is... This, this is our first opportunity for learning, and it's the most powerful learning that I've had since I started college as an undergrad. I mean, those are the kind of comments that come out of this, because there are so many opportunities to begin to enact system change and to learn and be vulnerable and be courageous that um, it's really unparalleled, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So listeners, uh, I will put a link in the show notes for uh, the website. So if you're interested in the information or to register or to join in on, on the work, uh, that'll be there for you. And one last um, aspect of your work that I want to give you a chance to talk about is the equity audit that is available also to school leaders and schools. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, the, so an equity audit is in our view, so you know, you should know that there are different ways that people approach equity audits. When 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 my colleagues across the country in different spaces first started to talk about the equity audits, um, what they did is that they thought that discussing trend equity data is where it should start and where it should end, and I don't agree with that. Um, so we're online at adjusted.org and for the culture responsive school leadership institute is crsli crsli.org. But what, what, what equity audits uh, can provide in our view is uh, root cause analysis. And so in other words, if you have someone like a Dave Heistead who was in Bloomington, we work, we work closely with them or another good like psychometrician or data expert on your staff, you don't need somebody to bring all of the equity data into a nice worksheet for you to see. I mean, why would you pay somebody to do that? What you rather have is some, a scholar like myself, and I work with an expansive team to, do, to get this done, is to go and to show you why your data is looking like that year after year. Not if it's looking like that, because you would not be calling us if, it, if you 
did not already know that. You know that your data looks like that. Now, it is something to be said about pulling all of the different, because, you know, again, it's, 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 it sounds so intuitive, but I've seen districts focus on discipline data one day and then focus on attendance data. Why don't our students want to be here who are from certain backgrounds, enrollment and attendance, and then focus on disciplinary and then academic, and then focus on extracurricular. And then, now, why would you be talking about all of these different, I mean, what can you see when you look at all of this at one time? So there is something to be said about looking at the trend data, but you know it's there. Why don't you talk about why it's there? So that's what we've developed. We've developed surveys for students, parents, uh, teachers, and administrators. Wait, yeah, students, parents, teachers, and administrators. Sometimes cabinet will take the administrative survey and then uh, board members for districts would take that as well. But then it gives us why these disproportionalities continue to happen year after year, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well, where you should start the equity work, right? So that's why we often recommend folks do the academy and do the equity audit so that number one, they, they have the tools to begin to enact changes when they see the equity data, but then they know what they're doing well already. They know what they can prioritize. They know what's cheaper. They know what's gonna take five years. You know, They have some meaning about how to prioritize their equity work. And without an equity audit, it's like shooting in the dark. Yeah. Oh, uh, we heard that that district did PBIS. Oh, we heard that they did uh, Check and Connect. And we heard that they did Restorative Justice. Let's do those three things. And then you look up in three years from now, nothing yeah. has changed because they were not intentional about how they selected reforms. Mm -hmm. They were, I'm, I don't mean a discount. I should say they were not academic. They were intentional, right? right? I mean, educators are working. I'm, I am not here trying to slam educators. Both of my parents were retired educators. I was an educator in Detroit public schools for years. I love educators and I'm a professor of education. I love it. But there are, are there ways to be more academic and to become smarter about how we implement, uh, scientifically implement this stuff? Are there ways to become smarter? I, can we know what we have already excelled at, what we're doing well, how we can invest there? Can we know about the things that will take one or two years and it's not a heavy investment? Can we know about the things where we know we got to make a significant financial and time investment and it's going to take five years in order to enact and see this change come out? Can we have conversations about that? And equity audits empower educators to have just like those kind of yeah. conversations. Um, and you can find all of the work we do online. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and we would, we would love, we've already partnered with many districts across Minnesota and we would love to continue to do that in any all capacity. Right. We'll, we will, uh, I'll, I'll mention those websites one more time as we finish up. Uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, this uh, listeners, the book is culturally responsive leadership, school leadership. Uh, go ahead. No, I was gonna yeah. say culturally responsive school leadership. School leadership. Yeah, I, yeah that's good. See, you're always a professor, always correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, culturally responsive school leadership, it is a fantastic read. Uh, I could not be more impressed uh, with your work. And I really appreciate you uh, being here. But we've got a couple more things we got to get to. And we've had a pretty intense, heavy conversation. And it's it's necessary because the work is is ongoing and it needs to continue. But we're going to finish up with uh, a couple of uh, lighter notes. Uh, we're going to talk here first about uh, thinking about some fun and a, a segment that I call three questions where we're going to give people a chance to get to know you a little bit on a more personal level. And then we're going to finish up with one more question about success and happiness. So you can take these questions wherever you want to. Uh, you, you just you know, they'll, they'll offer you some choices and we'll get a little insight as to where, where Dr. Khalifa is. So here's the first one. You know how people always say, do you want the good news or the bad news? So would you rather hear the good news first or the bad news first? <laughs> oh, oh my God. I, 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 I... I think I want to hear the bad news first because I don't think I can live with myself as I'm waiting. I mean, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> I would be sitting there like, just give it to me. Just give just it, give to, it me. to me. I so know. Let's give me the bad news first. And then uh, hopefully if it's too bad, we can end with, we can, the, the good news will brighten the, bring it, <laughs> brighten bring the it back mood. home. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Second one. Would you rather have nosy neighbors or noisy neighbors? Oh my God! <laughs> you named the worst two possible. <laughs> the worst gotta of pick, all is gotta pick nosy. one. <laughs> oh God! Uh, 
well, damn, I got to be able to sleep at night. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to use that word. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I, I got to be able to sleep at night, but man, I cannot stand nosy people. I guess give me the nosy ones. Uh, so the noisy uh, or nosy? Nosy? <laughs> nosy give me the nosy neighbor <laughs> and they're gonna want to know all uh, be all up in your business all right uh last one uh would you rather take an action-packed european vacation of course post-covid would you rather take an action-packed european vacation or spend two weeks at the same resort in the caribbean caribbean yeah caribbean yeah absolutely just type b lay out in the just enjoying the relaxing time yeah. Oh man, let me get sunburned. Let me see. I, I'm missing some of my melanin. You know, my melanin has not come back yet because it's been the winter. So I got to get that melanin. Just lay right. up. Give me the drink. Let me get it. Yeah. yeah. You li living in Minnesota and Ohio, you need to move somewhere else for <laughs> oh, that's sure. Right. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's right. All right. Let's finish up with one final question because I know we got to get you out of here. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time. But my final question to you is a question I ask all of the interviewers or interviewees, I should say, all, all of the people that have been on the podcast so far. And it's a theme I'm trying to run through the podcast about success and happiness. So the question I want to ask you is the same question, which is if a random person stopped you on the street and said, what's your definition of success? How would you answer them? What is success to you? Success to me is, I think my, mainly comes into two, two areas. One of them is the ability to, to live out your full humanity and to be content with that. Mm -hmm. um, success to me is to be, it's not, I, I, we know billionaires who are not happy. It's not money. We, we know people who are very accomplished and who take their own lives. We know people who, um, you know, have been at the top and they fall. And because their identity was connected to that and not, not uh, to their own humanity and their own worth, um, mm -hmm. you know, so being content Knowing who you are and being content with that is, is part of success. And then the other part um, of that is being able to positively um, influence others to become more human as well. So being if something, it does not have, you don't have to be an educator, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be an advocate, but just even with yeah. your children, just able to leave other humans at wide or small scales, other humans with the ability to also connect with who they are as humans and what, whatever that might mean is some, for some people is spiritual, for some people is, is yeah. cultural, historic, whatever that might mean for you. Wow. Well, that is a, uh, a great way to think about this in terms of being content versus, you know, it doesn't mean we're complacent, but we are content with who we are. And I, I love that. Um, Muhammad, I, Thank you so much for being here today. Listeners, uh, I would really encourage you to follow Dr. Muhammad on, on uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, his handle is at School Equity Pro, exactly as it's spelled, School Equity Pro. Uh, the equity audit, you'll find that at www.adjusted.org. That's the website for the equity audit. And of course, wow. the cultural, culture, Culturally Responsive School Leadership Institute, www.crsli.org as well. Uh, Muhammad, any other websites, yes. uh, things yeah, you want to yeah. mention? I, 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 we, we, I, I spell, we intentionally spelled adjusted with, without the first D. I, I, we do know how to spell, but it was supposed to be shorthand for oh, a yeah. just education. So it's a J. Just, -E. Yeah, I'm sorry. My, my apologies. www.ajusted. Dot org. Uh, yeah, I guess I just default to to the spelling. No, you. I, I know you know how to spell, <laughs> but I appreciate it. that's good. Good to know, and and certainly we'll make uh, that website link available uh, in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, Muhammad, I, I can't thank you enough for for being here today. Uh, I truly appreciate uh, the, your insights and and uh, the, and the continued work that you're doing. And I've certainly learned a lot today, and I know listeners have as well. So thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. It's been such a joy to be with you, Tom. Thank you. All right.